Ahoy, we have a new New World update and this is a good one. This is update 1.92, so this is a balance update following the content patch with the forge and everything that came with that. So we are likely going to see one of these one month from now again. They said they want to do one balance update every month and then we have the next content patch. But this one really adjusts some of the major concerns that the last patch introduced. So I'm very happy about that. I've already tested some things as well that we'll talk about. Let's begin with the Springtide Bloom event. Very briefly, it's just the event that is now in the game and you can go into various towns and the event locations uh, to do that event. I will make a more in-depth video about that with some tricks to make this quicker. I already made another one that I will link at the end where I explain the event in general if you're interested in that. But this is just one part of the patch. The new weapon quest gets some adjustments so you can do everything in one location at once. That is nice. The hair color issue that appeared with the last patch is also fixed. And there was a cave that people couldn't enter. AI gets some minor fixes to hitboxes and attack chains. But the most important thing to me are the combat changes. The first two here are more like small quality of life things. Uh, not really anything changed here, just adjustments to make things work properly. And then we have reduced red color intensity of enemy spells and abilities. So there should be a bit more visual clarity again when enemies are using AoEs. And then we have a very interesting shift when it comes to armor. Slightly increased armor mitigation for both medium and heavy armor. In medium armor the ratings are increased by 2.5% and in heavy armor the ratings are increased by 5%. This is interesting because I very recently posted a question to them about that exactly. Not in that sense, I was more asking about uh, if there will be any adjustments to the armor gap that currently exists between medium and heavy because it's very close so medium gets a lot more armor compared to light and heavy doesn't get that much more because you can wear multiple heavy pieces while in medium but this change can kind of take care of that I think at least to some degree. And this change also doesn't happen in a vacuum. There is a shirking fortify buff or a fortify buff in general as well. So for shirking fortify in particular the Shirking Fortification effect is increased from 3.9% to 4.7% per armor piece. Now, does this mean you should immediately dump all your elemental aversion and go back to Shirking Fortification if you already had it, or do you need to regear? No. Hold that thought. I will discuss this in much more detail in the coming days. I will break that down for you, what exactly this means for every weight class and everything, but don't worry too much. The changes will not mean that you have to regear entirely again. Uh, there are some situations where this could be impacting you to some degree, but I already made a video talking about how to effectively utilize Fortify perks or Elemental Aversion in the past, uh, where I discussed how you should effectively gear that you kind of have a bit of armoring against everything. So if you've watched that video and followed that advice, you kind of are set for this patch already as well. It's kind of still something that applies now. I will link that right here in the corner and also at the end if you want to know more about that. But I will talk about these changes in particular more very, very soon. If you're interested in that, consider subscribing and clicking the bell if you haven't yet. Sturdy Fortification also gets an increase from 4% to 5%. I think this is a maximum of 25% now. So this is technically a very interesting perk if people were running more Sword and Shield in PvP. The Fortifying Whirlwind perk on the Great Axe also gets a buff, increasing the armor value from 6.6% to 8.8%. And if you have it on your weapon, then it's increased from 10 to 14%. I don't think people usually want to run this on their weapons, though it could be almost interesting now if you want some really quick fortify stacking in heavy armor. Maybe there's some use to that, I'm not sure. But uh, overall, I think most people will prefer Enfeebling Maelstrom most of the time. But when it comes to mitigation, there are also some weapon changes. The Great Axe gets an increase to Crowded Protection from 10 to 20%. This is the direct armor increase when three or more enemies are within four meters of you. The Warhammer gets something very similar with the outnumbered passive, uh, also affecting armor increased from 10 to 20%. In case of the Warhammer, you have to have two or more enemies within three meters of you. Power Cleaner, the first upgrade of a clear out, which provides you with 10% fortify currently, is increased to 20%. For Sword and Shield, the defensive training passive, which is also a fortify when you block an attack, is additionally increased from 10 to 20%. You could see that between this and the buff to sturdy fortification, Sword and Shield would have pretty massive fortification in PvP as long as you're not switching weapons. Unsurprisingly, the Fire Staff is getting hit with a few nerfs as well. 
They're affecting fairly different aspects. The first one is more of a band-aid fix. They're temporarily disabling the watch it burn passive being able to trigger off a critical hit from the first hit of Meteor Shower, but they will re-enable this when a larger fix is available. I'm not sure what exactly is going on there. I'm assuming there's a way to get multiple stacks fairly quickly with Meteor Shower somehow. Uh, either way, this will be back eventually, so you can get one stack of Meteor Shower. Flare, one of the major changes of the Fire Staff, sees some significant changes. So Flare is the effect that allows you to deal AoE damage with heavy attacks. The damage of this AoE is reduced from 140% to 110%. However, in return, the projectile slowdown is also removed. It had this 25% projectile slowdown, I think it was, uh, in return for getting this heavy attack. So what this effectively means is when you use a heavy attack on a target, you don't get punished in any way for having this upgrade. So if you're normally attacking a target with a heavy attack, it will deal the normal damage, as far as I understand it at least, and you will have the normal projectile speed. So in that regard, it's beneficial. But in AoE situations, the damage will be lower on other targets hit by the AoE. This has an important side effect, which is why I think they have primarily done this. Uh, one thing that players figured out was that you basically no longer have to aim at an enemy player, you can just aim at the ground near them and you will hit them with that AoE for 140% damage with heavy attacks. And that was a bit of a problem because you could just kind of aim in the general direction of the enemy and you would very reliably get very high damage through that. And that is something that I'm assuming they don't want. They want you to actually aim at the target and then have that additional benefit from the splash damage instead of being like, I just aim somewhere around there and hope that it hits. Of course, this is still decent Anyways, if you hit someone with a splash that you just nearly missed with a normal attack, that's still extra damage or dealing damage in the first place that you otherwise wouldn't have dealt without the splash. So it's definitely still good. And now you no longer have the slowdown as well. It's just that this one particular situation is getting a bit of a nerf. And of course situations where you're just hitting a big clump of enemies. And speaking of big clumps of enemies, Pillar of Fire also gets a nerf. Reduce the cooldown reduction value on armor from 17 to 11% and on the weapon from 30 to 20%. I would say this is a little bit rough for those who have specifically crafted a fire staff with Pillar of Fire, but it was also somewhat expected to be honest because of how exactly uh, this worked. So the situation was that effectively if you had the right gear, you could get to a point where you could just spam Pillar of Fire constantly as long as you're hitting two targets. Uh, just infinite Pillar of Fire once again. Uh, something we have seen in the past before, a uh, long time ago when there was a bug with it. This time it wasn't a bug and more a result of going heavily into refreshing uh, and having this pillar perk. So that should no longer be the case now. And I think that's okay. I think uh, while this was funny, I think that's fine. And you can still get very high cooldown reduction overall with this. Uh, so you can still utilize this effectively uh, if you weave in some other tags in between as the game should probably be played. So generally speaking, a few nerfs to the Fire Staff here, but nothing that would take it out of play again, in my opinion. I think this is still going to be a very decent weapon. It still has a lot of the new benefits, the new playstyles and everything. Just some tweaks to bring it a bit more in line with other weapons. The Musket is getting a buff. Steady Aim has a decreased charge up time uh, from 2 seconds down to 1.5 seconds and from 1 seconds down to 0.75 seconds while in shooter stance. And along with that, they've also increased the response speed of accuracy markers on the reticle when accuracy changes. You can see that here, it's a lot more snappy, a lot more yeah, responsive and quick now. And I think that's important. I think that's good. You need to have visual clarity on how exactly your aim is working, how it feels. And if those indicators don't match your actual aim, it just feels bad. And with that now being resolved, it should be a lot better overall. I think still that the musket is a bit of a sleeper at the moment. I think the musket is technically a very good counter, especially uh, to a meta where fire staff is prominent, where bow is also prominent, as long as you can stay at a distance. But then you have to also get the accuracy perk at that point, probably. And people don't like doing that. They don't like that downgrade that they have to take. So they don't want to use it in the first place. But maybe that will change if we look a few changes further down. First we have a quick nerf to the Ice Gauntlet, reducing the Entomb's health from 75% of the player's max health to 50% of the player's max health. Not entirely sure why that's happening at the moment, I feel like the Ice Gauntlet is a bit of a sleeper weapon, but not because of Entomb. So I'm not really quite in the clear as to why this was chosen, but I feel like there must have been something behind it uh, that led to this. On the Void Gauntlet they fixed an issue that caused the Void Blade to have tracking issues with targets. 
Now, I feel like this was already changed in the last patch and they just didn't include it in the notes, but maybe they did something further than that. I tested a lot with the tracking, it seemed to work at least much better than before. And now, let's talk about the reason why some people at least may be switching back to musket. The bow is getting nerfed. Added damage falloff to all bow attacks. Damage falloff will start at 40 meters and reach 50% damage reduction at 100 meters. Welcome to the musket club. Along with that, decrease the hitbox size of the heavy attack and ability projectiles from 0.33 to 0.275. Again, the bow is still incredibly easy to hit because of the massive hitboxes, so that being nerfed a little bit, not really a surprise. I am very curious to see how these changes will really play out, and I can see the direction that AGS is taking, and I like it. They're kind of forcing those very long-range weapons to have to fight at a bit of a closer distance and make it fair through that, right? If you have too much time to deal tons of damage before the enemy can close the distance to you, uh, that always will feel unfair. Whereas if the damage is only coming in once they're at a reasonable distance, so uh, they can use tools to close the distance without feeling immediately punished for, for example, uh, wasting their mobility, uh, and you have to kind of position strate strategically at a middle point between too far away and too close, then I think ranged weapons can overall reach a point of balance much better. So I'm very happy uh, with these changes. I'm sure some bow players will be less happy. But honestly, even running a bow with low decks while testing things, the damage always felt too much to me. I, I gotta say, I think of all weapons, uh, this one deserved the nerf, this patch the most. The bow really shone after the four changes and everything. So yeah. It's also having a field day because of a lot of people going heavily into Elemental Aversion and Elemental Resist due to the Fire Staff. We are not seeing any blunderbuss or Rapier changes this patch. Uh, I would have expected especially the Rapier PvE capabilities to be nerfed a little bit because the damage at the moment is wild. But maybe I'll just have to make the video about Roger's Rapier Guide first and then people will realize just how good it is. But of course, it wouldn't be a new old patch if there wasn't at least one thing in the patch that I also disliked and that is the next change. Added 8 new season activities to replace some imbalanced ones. Craft 5 items using timeless shards. Uh, okay, I guess that's quite a lot for a single activity, uh, considering timeless shards, depending on what you're crafting, aren't that cheap. Craft 10 recipes requiring poultry thigh. I think that's usually not that expensive, so it's kind of okay. Cook 10 recipes requiring sumptuous rabbit. Uh, if you buy that on my server, it's, it's 500 gold right now and it's probably gonna go up and cook 10 recipes requiring prime armadillo. I'm not sure what's going on here. I, these seem excessive to me for being a single card compared to other activities. I feel like this is more imbalanced than before. I just, this is stuff that I will just always skip because it's just too expensive and not worth the hassle. So yeah, that's kind of weird. Then you have salvage three named tier five items. Uh, it's fairly easy if you run expeditions, I suppose. Uh, use 10 a tier 5 weapon coatings, that again feels completely out of proportion by 10 compared to many other things. Like, that's 5 dungeon runs or, well, depending on uh, which run dungeon you're running, but generally it's it's a lot. And uh, also uh, use 10 tier 5 crafting consumables and use 10 tier 5 uh, resistance consumables. Resistance consumables are great and I love using them, but in most situations I'm hoping that I'm not going to use 10 of them in a short time span. Uh, but rather use them occasionally in emergency situations. So that's a card that is not worth doing again. So yeah, I really am a bit confused about these. It feels like whoever came up with these didn't really adjust the numbers properly. I wasn't familiar with how long some of these things take. Uh, I'm definitely not going to burn a bunch of consumables or craft a ton of uh, relatively expensive to do things in order to flip cards when there are much easier ways to do it, especially with a new event. I will talk about very nice methods to do that very easily uh, in the next days. So stay tuned for that. There are a bunch of minor fixes here. I'm just going to show them quickly. Most of these are not that important. But two of them I want to point out. The first one is uh, remove procedural gathering sets from the named item loot table. So what happened a few patches ago is that they kind of added in uh, those gathering sets as something that can drop from various mobs and they would share the loot table with named items. So for example, if a mob drops two named items and then drops one piece of, say, the fisherman set, then I, as far as I understand it, at least, uh, they would be competing. So if you get the, the roll to the point where you get one of the named items, you're guaranteed one of the named items, uh, then you would still have to 
basically the role will still decide between the two named items the mob has and that fisherman's piece. I may be wrong here, but that is that is my understanding based on how they're wording it here as well. Uh, which would mean that effectively having those gathering items in these drop pools meant you had a lower chance of getting the named item that you want. And likewise, we have fixed an issue that prevented the PvP reward track rank 200 players from completing the Reaping the Rewards season journey task. Then we have some more minor fixes here that you can just look at on screen. Unfortunately, still no fixes to friends list as far as I can tell. From my testing so far, the issue that was previously happening with the springtime event is fixed and I found one, well, middling bug, I would say, so far that is affecting some players more than others, which is that currently the leaderboards are bugged and people are basically treated as if the season has ended and are getting rewards for that and getting titles which they shouldn't have yet. But at the same time, the leaderboards are still intact, so it's not like they've been scrapped or something. Uh, as such, I'm assuming they're just going to reset that somehow or they just say, hey, okay, you got that title for this time frame and whoever gets it at the end of the season uh, gets it again or something. Either way, it is annoying for anyone who has titles because they keep popping up wherever you go and every town you go. So I'm hoping that this one will be a fairly quick fix, but not a major game-breaking bug either. It's just a bit of loading whenever you teleport somewhere. We have much, much more to talk about. There are various other changes that are not in these patch notes, various other things uh, surrounding New World that I need to talk about. We're going to do that. I want to talk about some tricks for the new event, and I also want to talk about the Fortify changes, as well as the mutation guide that I had to delay because of this stuff now. So tons of stuff coming. If you're interested, consider subscribing and click the bell. If you want to support me further, feel free to head over to my Patreon. I also do early trading tips there, and thanks to one of my patrons, Arkadamos, we actually had the tip early to get some Sumptuous Rabbit, uh, not because of this event, but because of the previous event, which made it cheaper. So if you happen to be on Patreon already, you knew about that, probably bought a few for pretty cheap, and can now use them for the new activity card if you want to. So that's pretty cool. More trading tips like that are of course coming. Thanks to my patrons for supporting this video, and thank you for watching. Duke Sloth, out.